so this is my first time with Arrow. And I'm, I'm disappointed I'm going to miss Sharon Stone later in the month, because she's wildly entertaining. I think that's going to be really fun. You guys have such wonderful programming. And we appreciate you including us. Uh, so I want to do a big thanks to Gwen and Nick and everybody here, and Lee and the whole gang at Every Picture Tells a Story for helping to organize this evening. So I'm an associate professor of film studies out at Wesley University on the East Coast. And uh, we have some alums in the audience tonight. Uh, I edited a new book on the director Ilya Kazan called Kazan Revisited. And we have some of the contributors who will be joining us later tonight for a discussion. The film critic Richard Schickel, formerly of uh, Time, uh, and a biographer of Kazan. And also the film historian Sammy Wasson, uh, who contributed to the book as well. Other contributors included folks like the scholars Leo Browdy, who's at USC, and Jane Basinger from Wesleyan. Uh, film critics Jonathan Rosenbaum, formerly of the Chicago Reader, uh, Mark Harris, who writes for Entertainment Weekly and for uh, New York Magazine, uh, Kent Jones, who writes for Film Comment. I'm sure I'm forgetting a bunch of people here. But anyway, it's a great array of folks, and the book is designed as a conversation. And the whole goal was to really enlarge the conversation about Kazan, because historically, we keep coming back to the same topic. So we really wanted to try and expand what we know about Kazan as a filmmaker. So we hope that you will join this conversation. Stick around after the film for the Q&A. We're going to do about a half hour uh, discussion up here and we'll open it up to questions from the crowd. And then we're going to go across the street to Every Picture Tells a Story where there will be a book signing and an opportunity for you guys to talk with us one on one. So I hope to see you then. Enjoy the film. Up the chairs, I thought I would introduce my uh, two comrades uh, who are here to represent the book. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, coming up first, Richard Schickel, a uh, long-time critic. Richard, um, what do 
you think, uh, either in terms of his, his specific film work or his approach to filmmaking, uh, what don't we know enough about uh, concerning Cassandra? What does it get the kind of attention that you think it deserves in terms of how he made the movies or specific films that he worked with? Well, it's, it's actually kind of a hard question, but um, uh, I think um, he was, um, at the outset of his filmmaking career, he really felt that um, he wasn't a filmmaker. He felt he was a stage director, staging things as he might have uh, in, in the theater, but not feeling that he had the uh, sort of the visual chops that he wanted to have, the uh, uh, sort of an expansiveness that he worked toward, I feel, you know, very, kind of self-consciously uh, in the course of uh, his career. And I, I think he came to a place where he was... Um, I think it's uh, I think it's uh, apparent in uh, you know movies like this one, uh, like uh, oh, uh, oh, probably the Steinbeck thing. Uh, East of Eden. Yeah, East of Eden, which is, opens up quite a bit. Um, e even uh, e you know, uh, one in New Orleans, uh, Panic in the Streets. I think you know he. he works the city quite well in that picture, and he was kind of proud of that. He, he really felt like he had um, gotten out, gotten into the streets, got the look of the place the way he wanted to. So I think it was a big theme in his life as, as a movie director, uh, and I think he was pretty successful with that. Wild River is really, I think, a very beautiful film. Uh, you know, it's a set in uh, the Tennessee Valley, when they're about to build the dams that would become the TVA. And uh, uh, that's, that's a beautiful film. It was very underrated at the time. We're actually not seen very much. You know, they opened it, I remember, in New York, one little theater on the Upper East Side. It disappeared. It was so bad that he tried to buy it back from the studio and, and, and release it on his own, but he couldn't, couldn't afford it. But anyway, I think that's a big, uh, big theme in his growth as a as a director. Uh, there are lots of other things. I mean, you know, I just was looking at the end of this film, the last half hour of it when I arrived here, and uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of overlit in that studio manner of the time. You know, it's kind of you know. But uh, one of the things that struck me just watching it is um, how very good he is uh, with Natalie Wood. I mean, I think she gives a wonderful performance in this picture. I sort of, it's been some years since I've seen it, and uh, I, I think there's a, a real texture to her, her performance, and uh, it's, um, it's very touching in a way, you know, uh, you know, her kind of coming to consciousness, coming to who she is, who she wants to be. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I think she, uh, I think she sort of does better than Warren Beatty does in the picture, who, who still seems to me, you know, a little bit awkward uh, in, in the picture, not really comfortable as a movie actor. But, uh, so those two things track. I mean, you know, he's, he's really good, uh, why I even say it, I mean, he's really good with performance. And, Often with unlikely actors, I think, you know. Oh, wow. Where's that guy been all our lives? You know, that kind of thing. Right. I agree. I, I think Natalie Wood steals the show, and, and her character has the most dramatic arc. I mean, oh, yeah, sure. Well, it's really her film, you know, yeah. I think. I mean, Bud and, uh, <laughs> Bud and his dad are, I think, pitched almost a little bit on the edge of a sort of darkish comedy there. Uh, that, you know, I. I I think is is interesting and all that stuff, but I, I don't think it, it really uh, it doesn't move you in quite the same way that Natalie Wood does. Yeah, let's get you to Sammy. You're coming to Kazan. Um, he's a little bit more new for you as a subject. So what, as you were watching his films and, and working on uh, the two pictures that you focused on, Baby Doll, Face in the Crowd, what was revelatory to you about his work? Well, 
how much Kazan really was trying to laugh. Um, like what Richard was saying about Pat Hinkle and, and Warren Beatty, you know, watching this movie, it's tough to know exactly when you are supposed to laugh and not. And as a viewer, it's tough to know um, whether or not that sits with you wrong or if it's sitting with Kazan wrong or if, in fact, the conflict is what he wants you to feel. Um, and I, I guess... had a very big message in this movie. It was a very anti-bourgeois movie. Right. And uh, I was conscious on his part. He really doesn't like those parents. He doesn't like the constraints of that community. Right. Uh, and um, he said that to me. I mean, that he was really, you know, the yes is set in the 20s, but he was really addressing kind of, if you will, uh, Eisenhower, post-Eisenhower America, and, uh, and really saying, you know, come on people, I mean, you know, young people have to expand, they have to not be held within the constraints of your previous generation, you've got to let them find themselves and all that stuff. I mean, in, in a certain sense, it's a very sentimental movie, you know, and, uh, and it was, you know, a very successful movie. It was his last really hit movie, and, uh, uh, you know, I think he's, it's not my favorite movie and all that, but when you're exposed to those people, they kind of reach out and, and touch you. But even Warren, I mean, that poor inarticulate boy who doesn't want to be at Yale, you know, <laughs> Uh, there is a comic element in that, you know, I mean, it's, uh, we've all seen that. I mean, you know, kids who don't want to do what their parents want them to do. I mean, it's just one of the great American themes, really. Ultimately, I found that the, the contempt that he feels for these people is so strong. that Kazan, yeah, yeah, yeah. That it actually makes it hard to laugh because he's so uh, against them um, for, for good reasons. And I found that continue on through Baby Doll and, and, and The Face of the Crowd. Well, those are both, to me, of the late Kazan pictures. Those two really, uh, to me, are, much, are superior to this film. I mean, I mean, and Baby Doll is funny. I mean, it's, you know. It wants to be. I mean, it wants to be funny, funny, and he is funny with it, and he was proud of that, that, it was, that he was funny with it. And, of course, The other film is, is is really a powerful message, you know. I mean, he was on to media manipulation and all of uh, that stuff that was just sort of nascent at that point. At that point, in uh, you know, the power of celebrity, it was a really very early movie that took up that subject, uh, corrupts people and all that stuff. So I, I think those movies are, to me, more meaningful than this movie, but. This movie has, a, you know, it has its, its charm, really. Yeah, what was it about A Face in the, in the Crowd? We were talking about how in, in this picture the deck is really stacked against the parents, even though we do have the uh, therapist at the end saying, look, your parents are people too. It's about the only nugget that's thrown in the direction of the, the parents. Um, but you brought up in your piece, uh, and it's true for the film that you wrote about Wild River as well, that there's a little more ambiguity yeah, the protagonist yeah. in a face. That, that's what makes it work better for me because power in these movies is so often the problem. Um, but Kazan satirizes power in a face in the crowd in a way that doesn't undercut his natural tendency, which is towards an aesthetic of power. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, Wild River is interesting because um, that was meant. The Montgomery Cliff character was not meant to be what he turns out to be in the movie. He was supposed to be a Jewish wise guy from New York who was going to come out to this province and these simpletons and show them the way and the light, you know. And <clears throat> But Monty Cliff was incapable, I don't know if he was ever capable of it, but by that time in his life he was not capable of playing that kind of a character. So the balance of power shifts in the movie and he becomes and weak and, you know, and, of course, the Joe Van Fleet character, the matriarch, you know, almost takes over the movie. So that he's 
kind of has to counterpunch with her. Yeah, it's kind of effective because I think he gives Kazan, who's a real New Dealer guy, you know, uh, he gives a stronger shake to the provincials in that movie than I think he maybe originally intended to. But he was the kind of director whose stuff kind of started bubbling in a direction he wasn't counting on. He would go with it. I mean, he, he, he liked that. That was, I think, you know, one of his strong suits as a director was that ability to let stuff happen to not say, no, 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 that's not what I intended. You, can't, you know, pound them into a little line. I, I mean, he was good at doing that. And, uh, you know, and he always said that Joe Van Fleet and Lee Remick, you know, made the picture happen. He said he really thought that, you know, Monty Cliff would, would just blow that movie away. You know, I mean, not in a good way. Weakness and his softness and his gentle way was going to, you know, just sort of destroy the movie. But in fact, he said those two women kept him in it. Yeah. You know, on the set, you know, all that sort of thing. Yeah, it's another excellent example of uh, the female performers and the female characters who we really don't tend to hear as much about with Kazan. Uh, all too often, I think they get short shrift. That this is a, another example, like tonight's film, where the women really shine in Wild River. This is a picture about a TDA administrator who goes down into a community and tries to convince some local people to move off their land uh, as about to be flooded from the dam. Their island. Their island, yes. It was not since the 18th century. Right, the multiple uh, generations. Um, and uh, originally, uh, Kazan thought of having Marlon Brando in the cliff role, which, as you say, would have completely well, you changed. Know, but, uh, you know, he said, you know, look, I wanted Brando in everything. everything. You know? <laughs> and that was, that was the relationship that he, he treasured, you know. Um, I feel like, you know, if you go back to his very first movie, uh, The Tree Grows in Brooklyn, um, that woman in there, uh, played by him, What's your name? The mom and the daughter. The mom. Dorothy McGuire. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she's a very good character. And she's a very strong character. I mean, that, the, the picture is hers, really. And, uh, and and she regrets having to be that hard. You know, she doesn't want to be that person. She wants to be. But she has to hold the whole works together, the kids and the drunken father and all that stuff. <coughs> I think, you know, by and large, you know, obviously On the Waterfront is a very male movie. But I think almost all the other movies, everybody gets a, a pretty fair shake if they're, if they're female. Don't you? Kind of? Yeah, yeah, no, I do. I do. Yeah, even the mom, you know, in, in this, you know, you kind of, you do feel sorry for her at that moment when she comes up Dini's to... Dini's mom? Dini's mom, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the um, scene at the end there where she's really almost just pleading for... Yeah. For an idea of herself that she hasn't really communicated to anybody. It's hard to understand, but you do always pity, and that makes it a little more common. That, that shades it, in a way. Um, I think that's the absolute essence of, of Kazan as a director. I mean, he very rarely, you know, unless it's Jack Palance or somebody, he rarely, he gives everybody a square shape. They all finally get their moment. They get their moment to explain themselves. And, show how they fit into the, you know, the entire context of the movie. I mean, I think that's one of his really good qualities. I've always wondered about, um, I, I don't even know if this is appropriate to bring up, but I've always wondered about um, later Kazan, towards the end, you know, we don't see those movies much, we don't talk about those movies so much. Well, you know, like, um, The Visitor, and yeah, yeah, and um, Last Tycoon, yeah. um, are there, are there pleasures to be had in those movies that we don't necessarily remember or talk about? Is that way? I, I, I don't think Last Tycoon, that was just one of those bollocks of productions, you know. I mean, it was that wrong screenwriter, Harold Pinter, for Christ's sake. Right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's a fabulous, fabulous writer, but that's not his material. Um, uh, what was the other one you mentioned? The vis the, is it called Visitors? Yeah, or the visitors? Visitor, yeah. yeah, I don't know. That's just... It's almost like a vanity production, you know, I mean, pretty much self-financed, you know, with some script. And the, and the, right, and the, and the arrangements, that's the Kirk Douglas? Yeah. Yeah. The arrangement, um, well, there he really did want Brando, and he really had Brando, and then Brando backed out at the last minute and 
think that Kurt Douglas, uh, which one didn't work out. I mean, he did his best for him. I mean, he was flattering to him. He was encouraging to him. <coughs> but there is something inherently villainous about Kurt Douglas. So it's very <laughs> true. <laughs> it's very true. It's all the answers. <laughs> But uh, he, I do feel that that picture, you know, might have worked, you know, with a different actor in it. And, and then you also have to, it's hard for directors to admit it, but they do go past their prime and they hang on. I mean, you very, very rarely do you find the late work of great directors, and they are great directors, that holds the candle to their early stuff. That, is a lot of it is energy, is, is standing on your feet. But everybody else gets to sit down on set and and keep driving it. And I don't think they even notice it, but they don't have that that power to command the whole works, you know, that you really have to have to be a director. Yeah, the strongest of the, the last bunch, I think, is America, America, a favorite of Martin Scorsese. Uh, and a hugely personal film for Kazan. Again, this is one we, we rarely see, although there's a gorgeous print of it. Um, and it's basically the story of how his family came to the United States. In particular, his uncle. His uncle, yeah. right. Um, who I was think it's a wonderful film, you know. I mean, black and white, beautifully shot. Yeah. But it... it, it he and Haskell really Wexler scrapping the whole way through it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I get more out of, you know, he liked to walk. So he's a walker in the city. You know, he 
walk around the block up there on the Upper East Side, do whatever he did. He'd rub against people. <coughs> that was central to the way he practiced his art, you know. Um, so I think it's, it's really important that, he, you know, he's not out here in La La Land, you know, he's not, um, you know, making kind of abstract social criticisms, you know, based on his very comfortable life that the directors have out here. And I think he was right. I, I think that one of the things that American movies miss is that the rub of life. You know, they're made, they're good, a lot of them. I'm not saying they're not, but that, that sort of, you know, being um, in the arena is also central to the way he worked on things. Yeah, very sharp observer of human nature. Other questions? Yes, in the blue. Uh, I was born and grew up in, in Israel, and I remember when the movie was released, I was like 13. Uh, we all sneaked into the movie, although it was limited, 18. Uh, we sneaked into the movie. I saw the movie, when it was released like five times. And it, it impressed a lot my generation, and it, it's one of the movies that impressed me the most, together with God in the Wind. And, so those, those movies. Uh -huh. So it, I, I can even remember the movie theater that was played. I remember every Maybe. single movie theater I saw any movie in. <laughs> That's true. I mean, because it's part of the totality of the experience, you know, this particular environment that you see a movie in. And so, you know, it gets click, click. <laughs> It's a perfect example of what we've been talking about is this prescience, this feeling that you know now is the time to be talking about this generational divide. Uh, let's take maybe one more question. Yeah. Uh, you know, this film touches on a father-son relationship, like uh, uh, *East of Eden*, and then even the arrangement between the yep. Kirk Douglas and Richard Wood. It's always the son who tries to please the father, and so on. Oh well, you know, because Kazam was, you know, his relationship with his father was the most fraught relationship of his life. I mean, he's working that out in almost every movie. But, but here is a bad handle of all the fathers. He's the one who is more over the top, and the relationship yeah. seems more sick in this film than in the other. More film. sick. Sick. It feels almost incestuous. I remember I read one uh, interview from Kassan, in Kassan on Directing, that he mentioned that the Pat Hingle had homosexual overtones in his over-ferocious uh, <laughs> heterosexuality. So, I don't know, maybe we could talk about it. How do you feel about that? I don't know. <laughs> no, but all, what I do know, his father was this ferocious guy. And, uh, I mean, just for example, he just wanted to go on the family carpet business. And his parent, his mother, I think maybe an aunt, you know, sneaked in the money and got him into Williams College. I mean, you know, and then the father had, you know, I think had virtually a heart attack when he found out about it. It was a terrible relationship. It has marked so many of Kazan's. I mean, there are far fewer mother-son or mother-daughter relations explored in his movies than there are father. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and one thing about, uh, I don't know about incestuous, but both of these, the mother of Dini, the father of Bud, they view their children as extensions of themselves, really, and as there to either play out the same role or a, um, a, a more perfected role within the family, within their community, and there, so there is that kind of bizarre intimacy, I can, I can understand uh, that feeling of a kind of sickness there. Well, but of all the three father figures, Richard Wood in the arrangement, mm -hmm. Raymond Massey in East of Eden, Pat Hingle is the monster. Yes. Of all three. I see one that, in fact, there's one scene where he's confronting the director of the college that Cassandra doesn't yeah. give him a close up. He shoots right. all over, his the shoulder. over the shoulder because imagine seeing Hingle was all over the place. Mm -hmm. So, oh, what and Funny enough, of all the three films, this is more contemporary to Kassan's age and yes. his confrontation with his father concerning his education. Yeah, his father wasn't at all like, uh, he was, I think, much nastier mm -hmm. than, uh, and insinuating than uh, Pat Engel is in this movie. I mean, Pat Engel is, you know, he's like, he's like a character of 
drifted in from Sinclair Lewis novel. <laughs> <laughs> really, you know, one of those kind of types. He seems insane. I mean, it's beyond, <laughs> you know, even his, his it's, he seems hysterical, you know. It's partly performance. It's partly Pat Hingle, I, mean, I guess. Well, that was, uh, Pat, uh, that was Pat Hingle's nature. He was, by nature, a kind of over player, you know. But Kazane liked him. I mean, right. and, you know, he used him a lot on the stage. Right. And, uh, and he get, he goes, he's not shy about putting the camera right in there, you know, really giving it to you. Yeah, yeah I think uh, one criticism I would have him is that he could be just as effective if you were just pulled back a little. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the framings are quite tight, that's true. Um, we, we sort of run out of time here, but we're moving across the street to Every Picture Tells a Story. Uh, will there be a reception and a book signing? I know there are some folks who have additional questions. Please bring those uh, with you across the street, and we'd be happy to chat some more. Um, there will be copies of the book for sale, uh, as well as many other books, and uh, we can talk and sign there. Thanks very much for coming out, everybody.